Good morning. Hope you're doing well. Thank you, Pastor Elisa, for uh, preaching for me last week. I had a board meeting at New Life, um, and so I needed to be up there, but I'm grateful to be back with you today. And anytime I take a break like that, I'm, I'm still working. There's still administrative stuff going on, but a lot of that week is spent trying to figure out what God is leading me to preach next. And I really had no clue, but God took me back to creation. And so I want to talk to you uh, over the next few weeks uh, from a series called The God of Creation. I was just going to name it Creation, and as I was developing it, I, um, I settled with The God of Creation because as we talk through the creation account in Genesis, that's who our focus is on. We can get so bogged down in the details of of what really happened, this and that, and yes, we're going to talk about that a little bit, but ultimately what it should result in is us being in awe of the Lord of creation. This is going to definitely be more of a teaching series. I've been told that I'm a teaching pastor, and that I am, but um, this will be like next level in terms of focusing on teaching rather than maybe purely preaching. Uh, I'm going to teach at least one application piece, one key application piece from each day of creation that stood out to me. So there's going to be a lot of facts, kind of, a lot of stuff that we work through the scriptures. And then at the very end, I'll kind of tell you how I applied it to my life, how God spoke to me through it. But as I'm teaching through this, I want you to be very aware of the Holy Spirit's leadings. We're going to take verses 1 through uh, 5 today and just break it down point by point by point by point. And there might be something that God speaks to you that stands out to you for the situation you find yourself in. And I encourage you to be open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and to dive into that. As you know, the um, beginning or however life was created is often debated in our world today and it is even debated in the church i kind of came up with a list here of some theories about creation uh as you know the world teaches evolution you probably was taught that in school at some point um but there's actually different ideas of what evolution took place there's some who call it naturalistic evolution which basically says that um, natural causes explain the origin of the universe and how humans came to exist. The next one would be unplanned evolution. They begin to get closer to the biblical narrative. They do believe that there was a supernatural being who initiated the evolution process. But this supernatural being does not intervene after the universe comes into existence. So basically, they say that someone created the world and the solar system and everything, but then they had no plan going forward. It just kind of happened. There's others who kind of take a different approach. They say a supernatural being did create everything, and then he had a plan that was in place for us to evolve into what, he, what we are today. These three are non-biblical theories. These are what's going to be taught often by um, people who may be agnostic, uh, atheists, people that uh, are in the world. The debate in the church often uh, can be concluded into two groups, old earth creationism and young earth creationism. Basically, what we can disagree on is how old the earth really is. Old earthers will say that God, yes, created direct, directly, as told in the Genesis count, rather than through an evolutionary process. They reject evolution, but they still view the earth as billions of years old, which would align with what scientists think. They believe that the Genesis account is compatible with science when you properly interpret the biblical account. So I'll give you some examples here in the series of where they differ from, from maybe someone that's a young earth person. Um, but an example of this would be they don't think that the days of Genesis 1 are literal days, literal 24-hour periods. They believe that God just organized it in a way that we could understand. There's also people who believe in young earth creationism. 
They believe that the Genesis account is true, that God created everything out of nothing. They put scripture over science, and when science draws the conclusion that disagrees with Genesis 1 and 2, those conclusions are to be rejected. They believe that the day listed in Genesis 1 and 2, they are literal 24-hour periods, and therefore they believe the universe is about 6,000 to 10,000 years old. You're not going to find a scientist that agrees with that most likely. Here's my stance. I'm not sure it matters whether you're old earth or young earth, as long as you know that God created everything. And scripture is above science. And scripture, as we're going to do during this series, should be interpreted literally. Unless it's clearly meant in a metaphorical way, like in the poetic books, like Psalms in some cases. One of the points I'm about to give you is that the book of Genesis is a historical account that contains facts that you don't take metaphorically, you take literally. And so looking at that, if I had to lean one way or another, I'm going to lean towards young earth. And I will give you theories on how I think that the uh, Genesis account and the young earth theory can align with what scientists have discovered today. But before we dive into it, let's talk about the general book of Genesis. Genesis means in the beginning, which is exactly how the book of Genesis starts out. Genesis is a historical book that was assembled by Moses, who most likely took multiple written and oral accounts passed down from generation to generation and brought them together. So I've already told you it's a historical book. That means we take things as fact unless it's clearly metaphorical. It was assembled by Moses, which obviously was a long time after creation was when Moses was alive. So what he has done is he's basically served as the editor. He is taking multiple accounts, multiple written accounts, multiple oral accounts that have been passed down from generation to generation, and have brought them together to put them into the book of Genesis. This leads into an interesting thought as we dive into the creation account. Moses was obviously not there at creation. Adam was not there at creation until later. So how did Moses get this information? A few theories that I have, maybe God told him directly. Because Moses did spend a lot of time with God directly. Or what if God told Adam, because Adam spent a bunch of time with God in the Garden of Eden, what if he told Adam, Adam told his kids, who told their kids, who told their kids, who told their kids, and eventually it led to telling Moses, who wrote it down. I don't really know, but I know that the source is God. And that leads to the last point. Genesis, as is the rest of the Bible, is inspired by God, and therefore true. We are going to value the Bible and what the Bible says over science. So as we begin this work today, as we begin working through Genesis 1-1, this is a definitely a note-taking uh, series, note-taking sermon, uh, and we put freshly new worship guides out in front of you, uh, so they should be fresh for you to take notes on if you choose to. Um, but I'm going to start with verse 1. Genesis 1-1 says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I called Don this past week and uh, told Don where I was going. And he's, uh, I said, I don't know how far I'm going to get into it. And he says, yeah, you probably won't be able to get very far because those verses are full of stuff. And this one is one of them. This one right here, we could do a whole sermon series on it. Uh, but I'm going to try to summarize it for you as we begin today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the scripture, I'm going to give you a summary, and then we're going to work through the summary. So in the beginning, and I put in parentheses, that our limited minds can understand, the Holy Trinity created outer space, heavenly paradise, the angels, and the earth. As soon as we start out and it says, in the beginning, you realize this is not really the beginning, because God has existed forever, which we can't wrap our minds around because everything that we have come to understand has a beginning and an end. 
But he is the Alpha and the Omega. There is no ending to God. So even though this is the beginning of what our limited minds can understand, it's really not the beginning because there really is no beginning because God's God. That blows my mind right there. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were born or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are are God. He's always been here. And we can't wrap our minds around that because we have a way that we understand the beginning and end of what life is like on earth. But he's always existed. Not only that, it says in the beginning, God. The word for God here, the name that Moses used for God is Elohim. Elohim emphasizes God's might and God's power. Another way of translating that is in the beginning, the mighty one. It's emphasizing God's might and God's power in creation, but what really blows my mind here is that Elohim is a plural form of referring to God. Yet it says that God created. So it's like it's referring to him as a singular, but he used a plural form word why could that be because he's pointing to the trinity so here we are we're four words in to our english version of the bible and we already have our first instance of the trinity the evidence of the trinity existing the trinity are three parts in one god the father god the son and god the holy spirit and as we work through day one today you're going to see all three parts of the godhead at work in creation So as we start this out, we have the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, that's doing the creating. Which explains why later, like in verse 26, you see God say, Let us make mankind in our image and according to our likeness. Who's he talking to there? He's talking to the other members of the Trinity. The next part of that verse says, In the beginning, God, or the Holy Trinity, created That word created is only ever used in relation to God. Because when you think about it, God is the only one in this universe that can create. The rest of us just take whatever has already been created and we mold it or make it into however we want want it to be. But it is God who is the one who can create out of nothing. Even when we make food, what are you doing? You're taking ingredients and bringing them together. If you take a, a plant or whatever and develop a fruit, and you know all of that has already been created. The closest we can come to creating is procreation, having a baby. But even then, you're taking two things that already exist. God didn't take anything that existed other than himself and develop everything that we know today. He created out of nothing Isaiah forty twenty five says this to whom then will you compare me that I would be his equal says the holy one in other words God is reminding us there is no one like our God and yet we tend to worry about things yet we tend to get down about what's going on in our life because we're afraid that God can't handle it there's no one like our God What's not in the Genesis count here is that God created the angels. And I'll get that in a second. It says that God created the heavens and the earth. And we'll get to the earth in a second as well. Anytime you see heavens in scripture, it can refer to multiple areas. So down here we have the earth, obviously. Heaven can refer to the sky. So this would be basically our atmosphere, what we can see. You think about back then, um, no one went to outer space back then. No one had a, a really good understanding of science or the way things work. They didn't have airplanes. They couldn't get that upward view. And so they believed that at one point that there was basically a vault in the sky, and that's what we could see was up to that vault. That was what they would refer to as heaven. They also would refer to outer space. So obviously they could see stars. They could see the moon. They could see planets whatever they might not have known what they were looking at but they could see into space they also referred to that as heaven 
Most of the time when we refer to heaven today, we refer to what the Bible would call paradise, which is the place of uh, God's dwelling place, the angels' dwelling place, where the angels are and where we will be one day. It aligns with Jesus telling the thief on the cross that today you'll be with me in paradise, a.k.a. heaven. So God, at this point, has created the heavens. What is he referring to here? He's referring, I think, to these two areas because the sky is created on a later day. So I think at this point, outer space has been created and paradise has been created. And at some point during this time frame, the angels were created. How do we know this? Because they witnessed the creation of the earth. Here's what Job 38, 4 through 7 says. God says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? Or who stretched out the measuring line over it? Or what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars, stars often refer to angels, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God, referring to other heavenly creatures that he created, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. They witnessed the creation of our earth. So before the earth could be created... The angels were created, and so they are up here in this paradise realm uh, is where they live and where they're based out of. So God has set up, let's focus on outer space, God has set up outer space at this point. I think he has set up everything that we need in order to be able to sustain life on earth through the universe. I read uh, a commentary, and in the commentary, he emphasized how our universe is just right. The universe has a just right gravitational force. If it were larger, the stars would be too hot and they would burn up too quickly and too unevenly to support life. If it were smaller, though, it wouldn't keep that heat close, and so the stars would remain cool, nuclear fission would never ignite, and there would be no heat and light. The universe has a just right speed of light. If it were larger, stars would send out too much light, and if it were smaller, stars would not send out enough light. The universe has a just right average distance between the planets and the stars. If it were larger, the heavy element density would be too thin for rocky planets to form, and there would only be gaseous planets. If it were smaller, planetary orbits would become destabilized because of the gravitational pull from the stars. And to go with that one, I was talking this over with Wes on Tuesday, and he pointed this out, so I looked it up and included it in the sermon. Saturn and Jupiter are hundreds of millions of miles away from us. But God, probably at this point, placed them there to protect the Earth from incoming comets and asteroids and to keep Earth's orbit just right to sustain life. So here we are, we're barely into the creation account, we're barely into the Bible, and God has already set up the universe just right for earth to be able to have life. Proverbs 3.19 says, The Lord founded the earth by his wisdom, and he established the heavens by understanding. I'm not trying to convince you today that there was an intelligent creator behind creation because I think that it is clear as day that there was an intelligent creator, our Lord God, who is behind creation. The chances of all that working out just right, mm -mm, it's not going to happen. And why did he do this? Why did he set everything just right? He did it for us. He didn't do it for the angels. He didn't do it just for them to witness. He did this for you and for me. Does that not make you feel special? So let's talk about what the earth was like at this point. And to do that, let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The earth was a formless and desolate emptiness. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. At this point, the earth is unorganized, barren. 
and very, and I cannot emphasize that enough, very dark. The words for unformed and desolate emptiness mean unorganized and barren. So at this point, God has created all the raw material needed to sustain life, but it is unorganized, as is there is no division between land and sea. It is barren. There are no trees. There are no animals. It's just a whole bunch of nothing, yet it's a whole bunch of something that's pretty amazing at this point. It's barren. It's empty. It's basically like everything is there for the potential for life, but life and organization hasn't taken place yet. And so I began to just imagine what this looked like. Scientists say that 71% of the Earth's surface is covered in water. So this would have been a whole bunch of water. But there is no divide between land and sea. So the water's not spread horizontally. There's also no sky and land and sea. So the water is even up and down unorganized vertically. So what I imagine, we know how deep our oceans are. It's very deep. I imagine all that water being spread out both wide and deep, basically going back up to the sky, because it's not been separated yet, going up to outer space, just a whole bunch of water. Right now, Earth doesn't really look like much. It's not necessarily chaotic, but it does lack form or any type of substance. We're here in the pottery capital of North Carolina slash the world. At this point, the earth would look like a lump of pottery clay that has no form, no pretty features on it. It doesn't look like it's much, but it is useful. It can be used to make something beautiful. There is no light at this point, so it is very dark, like the deepest dark that can exist. Nothing that we have experienced here on earth can even compare And because it's dark, what does the light do? It provides warmth. So this is a cold, a dark, a wet planet at this point. A bunch of nothing. Yet we see in the second part of verse 2, the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Out of the whole passage that we're doing today, this part means the most to me. Because here's a whole bunch of nothing, darkness, cold, damp. And doesn't it feel that way sometimes in our life? And yet the Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters. The Spirit of God who can give life, who can give light, is there, is present, is about to do his work. We just sang this, even when we don't see it, he's working. The word for hover there indicates, wants us to think about a bird. So the Spirit of God hovers over the newborn planet just as a mother bird hovers over their newborn babies. Have you ever seen that take place? I got a video here if it works. Of a, of a bird uh, hovering over its nest. See how it hovers looking at the, the babies in the nest? They do that for a few reasons. They can do that to protect their young Uh, I've seen them do it to feed their young. Um, They can do that as a way of sometimes just maybe checking and admiring what they have created. At this point, this is what the Spirit of God is doing. He's hovering over the surface of the waters. Remember, it's a whole bunch of water. So, uh, in fact, the scripture refers it to the surface of the deep. Because we think the oceans are deep. Can you imagine water going all the way up into the sky to the solar system and going all the way down and that's all there being? But the Holy Spirit is hovering. Now the Holy Spirit is often compared to and represented by a dove, such as Jesus' baptism. The word for hovering here is used to describe the actions of a bird, such as in Deuteronomy 32.11. As an eagle stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, he spreads his wings he caught them, and he carried them on his pinions. Isaiah 31, five says this, Like birds hovering, so the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem. He will protect and deliver it. He will spare and rescue it. 
And so what God is wanting to put into our minds at this point is that the Holy Spirit is hovering over that, um, over, hovering over the earth like this bird is doing over its young. It's preparing to do a work. It's preparing to, to bring life in a way that only he can. That meant a lot to me. Because this is about to be the very spirit that will bring order, that will, bring, will create animals and birds and all this goodness floating over the deep. It's a powerful image. Thought about how many times have we been in a dark situation and God is like that bird hovering over us, protecting us from things that we don't even know is coming our way. Who's like a, a bird, a mother bird, maybe just admiring his creation, loving you, being amazed at the way that you're living out your life and living out your God-given purpose. Think about that as we, uh, I'll, I'll bring it back up at the end. Before we move to verse 3, where uh, God says, let there be light, this is where some Christians who would come from the old earth background would say there's a gap. They would say verses 1 and 2 happened long before day 1. They would say that God created the heavens and the earth and then he just stopped. And it would be later that God created the light. Um, in other words, they would say that there is a gap, that's why it's called the gap theory, between verses 2 and 3. We're going to read it as if it all happened in one day, but I just wanted you to know that is one way they interpret it. So let's continue on in verses 3 through 5. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. How many of you were like me, and when you read that God said, let there be light, you thought, hey, the sun got created. Would that be you? That was not the sun. The sun's not created till later. Blew my mind when I discovered that this time around. So God, and we'll get a summary and then we'll get into it. Let's see if I can figure out how to get this off. God, by mere words, creates a temporary source of life, light, then separates that light from the darkness and creates an orderly day and night cycle. The first thing I want to point out is that this mere words, because the word that was used for God uh, spoke, God created, God said, let there be light. The word for that emphasizes the ease in which this was done. It was simple. It was not hard for God to do this. It goes back to him being Elohim, the mighty one. This is the first indirect reference to Jesus here in the creation account. John 1, 1 through 3 confirms that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through him, and apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. So when God spoke, this would be our first evidence of Jesus being present there, or second evidence other than Elohim, Jesus being present there at creation. Psalm 33, 9 says, For he spoke, and it was done, he commanded, and it stood firm. This was not hard for God. He creates light in the darkest of dark that we can't even imagine. All he says is let there be light and some type of temporary light appears. Yet we worry about God being able to handle our situations. We stay up late at night in the dark not being able to sleep because we're afraid of what's going to happen. God can handle it. Now this light is not the sun because in Genesis 1.16 is when the sun is made. This would be on the fourth day. It says in Genesis 1.16, God made the two great lights, 
the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And he made the stars also. So this light that has been created on day one is some temporary source of light. My immediate thoughts went to this being God because God is light. But it's not God because it's created and God is not created. God simply said, let there be light. I don't have any more theories for you on what this light is. I just look forward to asking Jesus one day what that light was. But it's pretty cool to think that at this point, some type of temporary light source is sustaining the earth. Some type of temporary light source has lit up his creation. And it's at this point that I assume the angels can see what has been created. So that verse we read about the sons of God shouting with, with joy and with the, uh, the stars or the angels worshiping God for what he's done. At this point, I imagine the light coming on and them shouting, being amazed at God's creation. And here's something cool to think about. This is the first time the angels are going to see material stuff. They're spiritual beings. They've not seen anything material other than maybe the solar system at this point. So they are looking at something that's just blowing their minds, and I can guarantee you it made them want to worship God even more. So God separates the light from the darkness to create an orderly cycle. We're going to see this take place all throughout the creation narrative. He'll create something, he'll separate it. The separation takes place in order to provide order. The first separation that he does is the light from the darkness. The light would dominate a time period. The darkness would dominate a time period. And he gives them names. He calls the, the when the greater light would dominate a time period, that's going to be day. It comes from a root word that means to warm or to glow with heat. The word for night comes from a root word that means to roll up, which may refer to getting cold and wrapping up in a blanket. So he's created this cycle where th there's going to be a time of light and there's going to be a time of darkness. He separates them and we're told there is evening and there is morning one full day. We're going to count that as one 24-hour period. So at this point, the earth may be already rotating on its axis if that light point is stationary. Another thing that could be happening at this point is that light source could be rotating, whatever that light source is. We don't know. We'll find out one day. But that concludes day one of creation. And so what did I get out of this? I get that our eternal, all-powerful, loving God will bring life and light into any dark situation as long as we give him glory. Let's have a real talk right now. It's easy to look over in western North Carolina and ask where God's at. And yet we're starting to see stories as social media, uh, as their cell phone services are coming back up. Um, we're starting to see story after story after story of how God is working over there, even in the midst of all this darkness. I saw one church today, all they requested was for a generator because they want to have church this morning. I've seen people that, um, I, I think I heard this one woman says that she felt like God told her to let go. And she did and went down the river and she ended up running right into rescuers or something. God's at work there even though it seems dark, even though it seems hopeless. It's been really cool to see the way that, I mean, our stores here are sold out of water, toilet paper, supplies, because everybody is sending it over there. That's great. That's God shining in the darkness. I don't know about your experience and in your life today, but I know some of you are going through some tough times. I know that it may seem dark. I know that it may seem hopeless. I know that it may seem lifeless. I know that it may seem like 
It's barren and empty just as our world was. But that doesn't mean God isn't God. And that doesn't mean God isn't at work. If God can take a barren and dark and cold and damp world and create all of this that he created, he can handle what you're going through. He can handle the dark situations that's facing you. He is the eternal one. There is no one like him. He is all-powerful, a.k.a. There's nothing that you will experience that he can't handle. And what's great about all of this is that, yes, he is eternal. Yes, he's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He is the Lord, our creator, but he loves you. So even though you may be going through a dark situation today, even though you may be facing something that you don't want to face, he, at this moment, is like that dove hovering over your life. Waiting to bring life and light. Waiting to work and move. How do I know that? Because he loves us. He's like that mother bird that we just watched flocking over its, hovering over its, its young. He is there for you. He's waiting to work. He can cause a light to shine in the darkness. And just as we maybe thought that light was the sun... Isn't there times in our darkness and in our life where we look for something as bright as the sun to help us? Isn't there times where we wish God would move in a certain big way like he did with the sun? But sometimes he'll give us a light that we don't expect. Sometimes that light may not look significant. Sometimes that light may not be what we think we need, but it is what we need. And ultimately, just as he provided order and direction in creation, he will take your life and the darkness that you're experiencing, he will provide order and direction through his guidance and his love. All that sounds good, don't it? This is only true for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Here's what Romans 8, 28 says. And we know that in all things, that God works all things around for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. The condition there is that those who love God. The condition there is those who have been called according to his purpose. As long as we keep the faith as long as we keep worshiping God as long as we keep giving him the glory that he deserves as long as we keep loving him he will work it around for the good no matter how dark it seems no matter how barren it seems no matter how hopeless it seems he can take it and he can handle it and he can work it around for the good And a good reminder of that is every time you look outside and you see a pretty flower, we're getting ready to see the leaves change and all the pretty leaves as you drive down in the the area. You look up into the sky, you see the solar system, you see all of this. If God can create all of that, he can handle what you're going through. Psalm 19.1 reminds us that the heavens tell of the glory of God and their expanse declares the work of his hands. Colossians 1.16, Paul tells us this, For by him all things were created, both in the heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, for the thrones or dominions or rulers or authority. All things have been created through him and for him. All things that have been created point to the glory of our creator. And so as I invite the worship team to come up, we're going to sing a couple songs, um, a kind of a mashup of two songs today. And they both emphasize the greatness of our God. I hope that you learn from day one and you're in awe of our Creator. I was. I am. 
And when you feel that awe, when you're amazed at what God has done, the only appropriate reaction is to give him glory. And so no matter what you're going through today, no matter how dark or barren or whatever Satan has made you feel like your life is, or your situation is, or your family is, or your work is, guess what? He still deserves the glory through it all. So I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet and we're going to pray.